Hi everyone, welcome back to Hidden Apologetics. I am so pumped that you're joining us today. Today I have the Dr. Ryan Mullins joining me. Um, as always, this podcast is brought to you guys at patreon.com, such as Apologetics. But Ryan, thank you so much for joining me. How are you doing today? Doing pretty good. That's good. I feel like every time I talk to you, you're in a different country. Like the last time we talked, if I remember right, you were in Philly and like we heard like sirens going off, if I remember right. Now you're, mm-hmm. I don't even know where. Talk a little bit about like who you are, what you're doing, where you're at, things like that. Yeah, so I'm currently in uh, my friend's haunted whiskey tasting room in Scotland at the moment. Uh, I'm going to be in and out of Scotland for a little bit to prepare for a wedding. I'm going to be performing later on this year. Um, So I'm at the University of Lucerne in Switzerland. And and so I teach for a master's program there in philosophy, theology, and religions. It's an online program. So people, if they, they could be anywhere in the world like I am often, and they can come study with me. Well, today we're going to be talking about like the doctrine of the Trinitarian processions. Ryan, do you want to talk just before we get rolling into this? Like, what got you interested in thinking about this topic? It was during my PhD when I was looking at the question of God and time and just trying to figure out all the different intricate like uh, doctrines and issues that are tangled up with that question. And I didn't realize that the doctrine of the Trinitarian processions was going to be intimately connected with that. Uh, and so we can talk a bit more about that in, in detail later. But that's that's originally how it was, was just just getting trying to get an understanding of basic Christian doctrine and how it all connects to the question of God and time. Yeah, so Christians are used to hearing about certain aspects of the doctrine of the Trinity. Um, they know that that they know the claim that there are three divine persons and one essence, but most people do not know about the doctrine of the processions. Uh, today, like, what is the doctrine of the processions? Yeah, so the claim is really clear. It's very straightforward. God the Father timelessly causes the Son to exist uh, and the Spirit to exist. And somehow this timeless cause produces a timeless effect. So the Son and Spirit timelessly exist, and somehow God the Father volitionally causes the Son and Spirit to exist and causes the Son and the Holy Spirit to have the same divine nature. So that's the basic claim of the processions. Ryan, what is the doctrine supposed to get you? Now, allegedly, it's supposed to secure something called the homoousius uh, of the divine persons. Uh, I'll ex- let me explain what that what that means. So, the homoousius means that the Father, Son, and Spirit share the same essence. Um, let me say something about the essence, like at a minimum. So, in order to have the divine essence, a person needs to have all of the great making properties or all of the perfections. And so, these are the attributes that explain why God is a perfect being. And, and so great making properties or perfections, these are attributes that are better to have than not have all things considered. So things like omnipotence, omniscience, eternality, like that, like, like that kind of stuff. And, and the claim that the father causes the son and spirit to exist is somehow meant to secure that the son and spirit eternally exist and eternally have the exact same great making properties or essence as the father. So you're on, you're on mute though. Thank you. I appreciate that. Um, Ryan, I'm just wondering, like, when contemporary Christians hear the claim that, like, the Father causes the Son to exist? I mean, like, for me personally, like, thinking, like, growing up in church, I'm like, I don't know what I would have thought if someone told me that. Um, What kind of reactions have you received, Ryan? So I, at first, I had a lot of people telling me I was just making this up. So a lot of lay Christians, a lot of pop apologists, uh, I'll just say, like, you're just making this stuff up. Um, and I think what this demonstrates, though, is just that a lot of the really, really big names in Internet apologetics, they just do not know basic Christian doctrine, uh, which is really unfortunate because if you're trying to defend basic Christian doctrine, you need to know the basic Christian doctrine part first. But anyway, so yeah, so the claim that the Father caused the Son to exist, it's a well-studied area of patristic and medieval theology. And I've published on this in multiple places. Uh, I've also had two published debates with William Hasker on the coherence of the doctrine of the processions. Uh, Joshua Sijuati, uh, I've done like a YouTube dialogue with him on this. He's published papers responding to me trying to defend the coherence of the doctrine. I've done a published dialogue with historians like Mark Edwards, who clearly says, yep, the father caused the son to exist. And that's what's widely accepted throughout history. So basically, anyone who's actually studied the doctrine of the processions in any sort of detail, they know the claim is the father causes the son to exist. But I understand why a lot of like Christians and why a lot of pop apologists are going to just kind of like balk at that. Be like, whoa, what's what's going on here? Because it really makes it sound like the son and the spirit are creatures. But that's not a new reaction, though. I mean, this is actually a very old reaction. And so you see the exact same reaction. And so, for example, like all the fourth century debates surrounding the significance, uh, uh, like surrounding the councils of Nicaea and Constantinople. 
So what you have in that time period is that there's these massive debates about the significance of the causal relations between the father and the son. And so many people said that this causal relation means that the son is the firstborn of creation. So he's like, you should like highly exalt him. But they would say he's not the, he's not fully divine because he's caused to exist. And so what you have in these cases are people are saying the homoousius doctrine is false. And then you've got this other group of people who are wanting to say, well, those causal relations somehow mean that the son is fully divine. So the homoousius doctrine is true. And we'll talk more about that later, but, but, but here's my point right now. So when people today, when they hear that the father caused the son to exist, it's, it, it's a very common reaction throughout all of church history has been to say, well, I mean, hang on. It sounds like you're saying that the son is not really God. So there's nothing really like modern about this reaction. It's a reaction that actually predates uh, the Nicene Creed. So sometimes people, Ryan, like people will say that like the early church meant something different by the word cause. Um, is that true? And what do they mean by the word cause in the case of the processions? So no, uh, the early church did not have some magically different understanding of cause. By cause, they meant production or generation. A cause produces or generates an effect. And we're talking about efficient causation when we're looking at the generation of the sun. Uh, and so it's true that when you're looking at the Middle Ages, you'll start to see uh, different people describe the generation of the sun in terms of like all four of the Aristotelian causes. But um, but there's still this widespread agreement that efficient causation is part of the story. So uh, Dr. Andrew Hollingsworth, he's currently working on a book manuscript uh, that traces out the history of all this. J.T. Pash has a really good book on the history of this in the Middle Ages. Uh, and he's very clear the concept is efficient causation of production. But here's something that's important to know. Uh, when you are looking at the entire history of Western thought, there are different debates about the precise way to formulate the implications of efficient causation. So some people say that causes are temporally prior to their effects. And then other people are going to say eternal causes have eternal effects. And these different kind of claims, they play a massive role in different theological debates. So for example, eternal creation versus creation out of nothing, these two different implications play a big role there. But they also play a major role in these Trinitarian debates. Uh, and But all of this is still thinking in terms of efficient causation or production or generation. So Ryan, you said that like these different ways of articulating um, the implications of efficient causation played a role in the Trinitarian debates. Uh, can you give some examples of what you're talking about here? Mm -hmm. So um, so take that first one where uh, causes are temporally prior to their effects. This is a very popular view across the globe. It's widely used in contemporary philosophy of time. Uh, so, so here's the idea. Uh, if something is caused to exist, then it must begin to exist. And to begin to exist is to be preceded by non-existence. And so in the case of the Trinity, here's what that would mean. If the father causes the son to exist, well, then the son must begin to exist. And so that means there was a time when the son did not exist. And that leads to one very popular version of Arianism that we see in the early church. So this group, uh, these early Arians, they said the son was caused to exist and thus the son did not always exist, which is why these early Arian groups rejected the homoousius doctrine because the son cannot be God if he's caused to exist. Now, the framers of the Nicene Constantinopolitan Creed, they didn't like this. So Athanasius, he's not a fan of this at all. He really does not like this at all. So what you see from Athanasius and some others who are trying to you know, come around this, the, the Nicene Creed, what they're doing is they're saying eternal causes can have eternal effects. So the cause and the effect can both be eternal. So kind of keep that in your mind with what I'm about to say. When you look at the Nicene Creed, you see both of these views of causation in there. They're both in the Creed. So the Creed of uh, a Nicene Creed of 325 states the son was begotten of the father. He's begotten, not made. So there's some sort of distinction between begotten and made. And we need to ask what those are because both of those uh, claims are causal claims. They're both efficient causation. Uh, they are two different implications of efficient causation that I just described. So Alistair Heron, Alistair Heron is this uh, patristic scholar. He says um, that the term begotten, which in Greek is genitas, uh, so the begotten in the creed, he says, it's intended to denote, quote, that which has a cause or source outside itself. So the begotten claim is cause. Um, but what Heron points out is that it's it doesn't have to involve the begotten thing beginning to exist. 
And so that's something that the, the pro Nicene theologians really wanted to emphasize. So they use the word genitos, uh, which is uh, created or made to uh, denote, and this is a quote again from, from Heron, that which has come into being. So the creedal teaching, here's what's going on. The creedal teaching affirms the son is caused to exist by the father, but in such a way that the son never began to exist. Whereas the father alone is unbegotten, uncaused or ad genitos, and is the source and cause of the Trinity. Like, and that's so according to not just the creed, but also like the president of the creed, um, the Gregor of Nazianzus. Now, let me mention something else important here, though. So I said genitos and genitos, and I'm assuming nobody can hear the difference between me saying those two words, um, because I, I can't tell the word. These are, these are Greek words. Uh, when you say it out loud, you can't hear the difference because the spelling is very, very slightly different, uh, which caused a lot of confusion in the early church. And in fact, a lot of people at these different councils I just mentioned, they forgot about the different spellings. And so they went back to referring to the sun as genitos uh, or as created. Um, so they started saying, yeah, the sun's, sun's created. Uh, he's genitos. And that just causes even more confusion. So what you have in these early Trinitarian debates is like this just absolute vocabulary mess. Yeah, I don't think I realized that like when we're looking at like these early debates on the Trinity, like there is all this vocabulary that's like mentioned. That's that's something interesting to think about. Um, also earlier, Ryan, you mentioned that like some Arians claim that the sun did not always exist. Uh, did all Arian groups affirm this? So no, this is another part. So you've got the vocabulary mess and then like history is just another mess of slogans and different ideas. So what we have in the Nicene Creed is the affirmation that the son and spirit are caused to exist by the father. And the father alone does not have a cause for its existence. Well, all the heretics said, yeah, we agree. So all the Orthodox are saying this and all the heretics are saying, yes, that's right. The question was this, what are the entailments of saying that the father caused the son to exist? And so you had that earlier Ar Arian slogan that I mentioned, like there was a time when the son was not, or there was a, sign, a time when the son did not exist. But that slogan was quickly abandoned by later Arian groups and then another group called Eunomians, uh, named after Eunomius. And so these groups, they denied the homoousius doctrine. They said homoousius is false. But they said um, the son is similar to the father, but they're going to deny that the son has the same essence as the father. And, and these groups, like they were they're very, very uh, popular. They held a lot of influence, especially outside of like the crumbling Roman Empire. Um, so I'm in Edinburgh right now, the capital of Scotland. If I go over to the museum, there's this huge collection of Viking uh, artifacts, and they have all these Aryan hymns and creeds written on them. So like it's, it's very popular. Now, so the, what this group would say, though, is they would say that eternal causes have eternal effects. They'd be like, we like that. But then they would say, the son is not the most high God. The son is a divine being. He's the firstborn of creation, but the son is not the most high God. And it might be going, well, why would they say that? And they're like, well, because anything caused to exist is not God. So basically what you see is the so-called heretics, they're accepting the same articulation of efficient causation as the so-called Orthodox do. But the heretics just say, sorry, but that still does not make the son God. Like the, the, it makes the sun subordinate to God. Thank you, Ryan. I did that thing where I was talking. I'm good again. Um, <laughs> so it's hard because you have this really amazing doc that you created to help kind of flow through this. I'm like reading, following, and I'm like, oh, wait, I'm talking, but I'm, I'm dumb you. Um, but like you talk about this idea of like subordination, and I want to get into this a little bit, Ryan. Um, in some of your publications, you talk about the different kinds of subordination throughout church history. Um, what is the bad kind of subordination that we don't want when we're formulating a doctrine of the Trinity? So the, the bad kind is called uh, ontological subordination. So ontological subordination, that's what you want to avoid if you're trying to affirm the doctrine of the Trinity. So if you want to say that the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit are homoousios, then you need to avoid this ontological subordination. So ontological subordination is when the Son has an inferior essence to the Father. And so let me kind of give you an example of this. So, so you and I, like we have an inferior essence to the Father, to, to, to God. God's essence is superior because God has all of the great making properties. God has all the perfections. Uh, well, you and I, we don't. Like God's omnipotent. You know, we're not omnipotent. God's perfectly rational. We're not perfectly rational. We lack a multitude of great making properties. And so that is why we have an inferior essence to God 
And so what we can say is we are ontologically subordinate to God. So when we kind of go back to the Trinity, here's what the claim is being made from some of these different groups. If the son lacks a great making property, if the son lacks some kind of perfection that the father has, then the son is going to be ontologically subordinate to the father. And that's not just a worry you see in the early church. It's a worry you see pop up throughout all of church history, all through to today. Right. And one of your debates with William Hasker, um, you also point out like the Neoplatonic influence on the doctrine of the processions. Can you talk about that for a minute? Yeah. So, so um, there's this guy named Philip Carey. Philip Carey's a, he's a really good scholar about like the early church and like the late antiquity and uh, early middle ages. So Philip Carey says the doctrine of the processions developed within the context of Neoplatonism. And so within Neoplatonism, you've got this idea of the one supreme being, the one with a capital O, uh, and like everything just kind of emanates from the one. Uh, and every emanation is a lesser subordinate being. And that's the kind of platonic context there. And so you might go, well, if that, like that should create an immediate problem for any Christian who's wanting to borrow that idea. That's not going to help with the homoousius uh, of the father and the son. Um, it, it seems like you're just going to be forced to say, well, if the father really is proceeding or like, you know, emanating from, or if the son's emanating from the father, then he's just going to be ontologically subordinate. That's just what the logic tells us. Uh, so here's what Carey says though. So Philip Carey, is, when he's pointing at his house, he says, Quote, um, in a nutshell, the pro-Nicene theologians use the, Plato the, the Platonist concept of eternal generation while denying the consequence any pagan Platonist would affirm, that everything generated is ontologically inferior to what generates it. It is a case of a conceptual resource too rich to be swallowed whole. So I, I, I think this is a problem. I think it's a very serious problem. And it's a problem that a lot of people in the, the, the early church time period said was a problem. But despite this, there was another, uh, like there's a different concern that a lot of patristics had that seems to carry more weight in their mind. And, and the worry is this, uh, without this causal sequence from the father, there would be three different principles or there'd be three different gods. And that sounds really weird and I don't really understand it. So let me repeat it. The worry in the early church uh, is that if the doctrine of processions is false, there will be three gods. Again, I don't, I don't really quite understand this claim, but the idea is that the father alone is the first principle. So Lewis Ayers, uh, he's a, uh, he's a historian. He explains the father is quote, the cause and source of the Trinitarian communion. And then Stephen Holmes who's another, um, uh, a church historian. He, he says, quote, the father is the personal cause of the son. And, and then he goes on to say, and because of this, they share the same nature. So the claim you see is that somehow the father's volitional activity to bring about the existence of the son and Holy Spirit is such that the son and Holy Spirit perfectly share in the divine nature. And somehow the father's causal activity guarantees the full divinity of the son, as well as somehow guarantees the unity of the three persons in such a way that there's only one God and not three gods. That's the, that's the worry they have. And they say this, this solves it. So Ryan, like, how exactly is like the eternal processions guarantee the full divinity of the Son and the Spirit? Because like personally, like when I think about it, if I think about like the Son and the Spirit, if they in some sense like proceed from the Father, um, I don't know. It's just tricky for me to think. How are they going to be fully God then? So yeah, what do you think? I don't know. Uh, I don't know how it does it, and no one does. Uh, so in fact, it's declared to be an ineffable mystery that you cannot pry into. So you see this claim from Origin of Alexandria. Uh, you see the ineffable mystery card repeated by Gregory of Nazianzus, Augustine, Peter Lombard, and on and on and on. And I think the ineffably my mysterious nature of this claim is one reason why you keep seeing some kind of Arianism just pop up throughout history. Like if the best you can do to defend your fundamental doctrines is appeal to an unspeakable mystery, you really cannot be surprised when people refuse to accept it. And I think the problem actually gets a bit worse. So, so Tim Paul, he's a contemporary philosopher. He points out that you cannot make an appeal to an ineffable mystery if your view entails a contradiction. So if your view like clearly entails some kind of contradiction, like someone's able to derive a contradiction from your different beliefs. And like, if you appeal to an unspeakable mystery at that point, it makes it look like you're choosing to be silent at an oddly convenient moment. So refusing to say anything does not remove the contradiction. 
And so appeals to mystery, they keep the contradictions firmly in place. Okay, so you mentioned this idea of like contradiction, Ryan. Do you think that like the doctrine of eternal possessions entails uh, contradiction? Yeah, the, the way it's it's typically formulated, I think entails a contradiction. So to be God is to exist uh, is, is to exist au se. Uh, so let me unpack that a bit. Um, so a being exists au se if and only if its existence is not asymmetrically dependent upon nor derived from anything outside of itself. Uh, now, remember then in the back of your mind, the doctrine of the processions is supposed to secure the homoousius of the father and the son. So the processions, it's meant to ensure that the father and son have the same essence or they have all of the great making properties. So the father and son have all the great making properties because the father causes the son to exist. The father causes the son to not have a cause for its existence. I, 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 it, look, I mean, if, if, the, if the son has a cause for its existence, then the son does not have the great making property of Osseity. Like, because again, Osseity is not having your existence asymmetrically dependent upon nor derived from something else. So the son is explicitly said to have exist, his existence derived from the father. That's right there in the doctrine of the processions. So the son does not have the great making property of Osseity. So the son does not have all the great making properties like the father does, which means that the son does not have the same essence as the father. And so here's what you get if you accept the processions and the homoousius doctrine together. The father and the son have the same essence, you know, because that's the homoousius doctrine, and the father and the son do not have the same essence. So the homoousius says the father and son have the same essence, but the processions entails, it logically entails that the son does not have aseity. So the son does not have the same essence as the father, which is why you get that contradiction. The father and son have the same essence and the father and son do not have the same essence. So it's a, it's a contradiction. And you can draw out more contradictions from other standard great making attributes so like self-sufficiency or omnipotence. Those are pretty easy to draw out the contradiction. Um, if you're like me and you want to say there cannot be any timeless causes with timeless effects, uh, then you could run a similar kind of argument for eternality. Um, so what you can do is you could derive several different kinds of contradictions from the doctrine of the processions and no, about, no amount of like ineffable mystery is going to remove that contradiction. Okay, thank you, Ryan. That's really helpful. Um, now let's stay focused on like aseity for or aseity for a minute. Mm -hmm. um, in response to your earlier works in this, some people have suggested that aseity is not a great making property. Um, if it is not a great making property or not a, like a standard essential divine property, then then it does not matter if the sun lacks it. What do you make of this response to your argument? So it's it's a weird move. It really is. Um, if you deny that I'll say it is a great making property, you're going to be able to remove this particular contradiction that I've pointed out. So you'll get out of the problem. You really will. Um, but I think you're going to get a new problem. Uh, and, and it's this, like I'll say it is a very, very standard divine attribute in systematic theology textbooks. And it's so standard that like entire books have been written on the attribute of Osseity, just in theology as a whole. And then in a lot of philosophy of religion, people are trying to look at the implications of Osseity for debates over God and abstract objects or God and modal logic or, you know, on and on you go. Uh, people are worried about Osseity as it relates to other issues. So in, in discussing the attribute of Osseity, so there's this philosopher named Lindsay Cleveland. So Lindsay Cleveland, she says, uh, this is a quote from her. Central to the traditional Jewish, Christian, and Islamic understanding of God is the view that God does not depend upon anything apart from himself for his existence. So that's, that's what, it, so Cleveland says, like, this is just part of, like, basically the Abrahamic faiths. And then she goes on to say that traditional theists like Aquinas, this is another quote from her. So Aquinas, regard divine aseity as one of the most fundamental aspects of our understanding of God. So it's fundamental. Um, so, so look, like if you deny that Osseity is a great making property, like that's something you can do. You really can do that. Uh, you can deny it's an essential perfection. All I'm trying to point out at the moment is that that's going to be very controversial and it's going to sound very implausible because Osseity is such a fundamental attribute that it will look pretty shocking to deny it just in order to maintain the doctrine of the processions. And then also you got to think about what the implications of denying that I'll say it is a divine attribute. Like if it's not an essential divine attribute, what, what follows from that? Well, here's what follows from that. So all these debates about God and abstract objects, they completely disappear. So William Lane Craig, he wrote two books on Osseity and Platonism. He's like really worried about this. And then Paul Gould edited a book um, uh, like on five views uh, uh, on God and abstract objects. All of those books were a complete waste of time. 
because I'll say he's not an essential attribute. So all, all three of those books, complete waste of time. Brian Leftow's book, God Necessity, uh, complete waste of time. Uh, the entire doctrine of divine ideas that you see, that's a huge doctrine throughout the, the Western world. It is seen to be a rival to Platonism. It's completely unnecessary. All the cosmological arguments that try to get us to an uncaused being, it's all a red herring since Auseity is not an essential divine property. So if Auseity is not essential divine attribute, a very large number of debates in philosophical theology, they're just gone. So some people, Ryan, might be worried that like if the doctrine of eternal possessions is rejected, then we have no way to capture the biblical claims um, about the begottenness of the Son. How would you address this concern, Ryan? So when, when I look at the Bible, I, I try to look and see, does it really match up with the claims I'm seeing the doctrine of processions? So you got to remember, the doctrine of processions says the Father timelessly causes the Son to timelessly exist. Well, here's the thing. The Bible does not teach divine timelessness anywhere. All of the biblical words for eternity are temporal words, and all of the biblical descriptions of God are overtly temporal. So you're not going to get the timelessness part. And then the Bible also never says the Father causes the Son to exist. So we're not losing anything of biblical significance by getting rid of this. Here's what we do see in the Bible, though. What we see in the Bible is that the Father sends the Son to perform a unique mission. So the incarnation of the Son, that's unique or one of a kind. And when you see biblical statements about the Son being the only begotten, what that word means is unique or one of a kind. It has nothing to do with causation. It is unique or one of a kind. It does not mean a timeless cause with a timeless effect. So here's what's going on. The Father sends the Son to become incarnate for our salvation. And that's certainly unique. That's certainly one of a kind. So any claim about the begottenness of the Son is about the temporal ministry of the Son. And it's not some sort of ontological eternal relation that the Son has to the Father. So if you reject the eternal processions, you can easily affirm the homoousius of the Father, Son, and Spirit because you're not saying that the Son and Spirit are caused to exist. You're merely affirming the biblical teaching that the Son and Spirit have a mission that takes place in history and their mission is incredibly unique. Okay, here's a final question, Ryan. Um, earlier you pointed out a concern that like some church fathers had. Um, if the Father does not cause the Son and Spirit to exist, then there are three gods. How would you address like this sort of argument that someone may bring forth? Yeah, because because like I said, like that was a big concern that, that some of the early church fathers had. And to be honest, like I'm not really sure how to address the argument because I don't understand the argument. I'd, I've never really seen it fully developed, and and so I think what it, first step is it needs to be fully developed so we can really see clearly what it is. And my guess is that when that argument's fully developed, there's going to be a lot of different assumptions that I'm going to reject. Maybe they're maybe I shouldn't. I don't know, but we got to identify what those assumptions are. So here's how I see it. There's one God and the term God refers to the Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. And each divine person has all of the great making properties. And then further, it is of the essence of each divine person to exist with one another in such a way that is metaphysically impossible for them to exist without each other. So this is sometimes called the doctrine of perichoresis, um, uh, which is a very, very traditional way of trying to secure the homoousius of the Godhead. Um, but if people want to see like the more technical details of all of this, they can look at any of the papers I have, maybe like maybe like the, one of the papers I've done with, with a debate with Hasker or something like that. Uh, most of them are on my website at rtmullins.com. And I highly recommend people read those papers before they commenting on the on the merits of the arguments. Well, thank you, Ryan. And a question with regards to like your doctrine, mm -hmm. like the doctrine of the Trinity you just brought forward. Um, if we think about like, and again, like any comparison between us and God, it can only be limited, like as we are limited. I think about like myself, like I'm a person with like my own like conscious experience of like being here with you right now. Mm -hmm. um, how do you use that compare with like the Father, Son, and Spirit? Like are, are there three centers of consciousness like us? Obviously God is not us, so any analogy can be limited, but like what do you make of that? Um, because I think some people might be worried as like, oh, if there's like three different centers of consciousness, well, like, is there the three gods that the worries about? Mm -hmm. Yeah. What are your thoughts here? Yeah, no, that's really good. I, as I see it, if, if we're really trying to say there's three persons, there better be three centers of consciousness to be a person just is to, to be like a self-aware, like thinking thing, like a subject, a person has subjectivity. Uh, and so this is something Linda Zagzebski points out in a few different papers and in her new book on omnisubjectivity is 
persons have subjectivity. So there better be three like sub, like centers of subjectivity or consciousness. Uh, and so, which is important when you're thinking about the different missions that the, the persons take on. Uh, if you don't already have this eternally being the case that there are three centers of consciousness, then it's difficult to figure out in what sense one of the persons becomes incarnate and the other one doesn't. Uh, and when the son is praying to the father, you're like, who's doing the praying? Is it one consciousness just talking to itself? That sounds silly. I, you know, like that can't be what's going on. So I think it's important that you have these three centers of consciousness. Now, like, how do you get them to be like one being? Well, again, so part of the, so what I said is part of the essence of these, these persons is they have to be exist. They have to exist together or uh, be perichoretically related, which is like this um, uh, inner, inner penetrating uh, is what perichoresis means. And so they've got this strong internal relationship such as impossible to exist apart from each other. And a lot of people like Gregory Nazianzus um, or Gregory of Nyssa, they would say like, that's all you need to secure the claim. There's not three persons or three gods. There's just one God. I don't know if that fully satisfies you, but at least I did like, that's the claim. Yeah. That's helpful. Cause like thinking about this um, as someone like, who's not trained in like theology or philosophy, I'm thinking like, okay, so like, let's say that like, we have like the three divine persons where there are in some sense, like three, like distinct, would you say distinct centers of consciousness, right? Mm -hmm. Um, so then like we have that and like to say like there is one God, um, it's looking at like the connection between them in the sense that like they are like, it's like, it's necessary. Like it had to be this way. Um, and it's like, they share, like, we'd say like, you would say, would you say something like they have like all the same attributes? Like they're all like all, all powerful, all knowing, like all that mm -hmm. stuff as well. Yeah. You have to, otherwise you don't have homoousius. So yeah, they're going to have to have all those uh, great making properties. Yeah, well, I think that's helpful, Ryan, and I can see that um, pretty clearly. So yeah, um, any like last thoughts or things you want to say? I mean, this has been really helpful, and I feel like in 32 minutes we covered a lot of ground. Um, yeah, yeah. Any other thoughts you want to share here? <laughs> we did cover a lot of ground, which is impressive because uh, when I've had to do some of these debates with Hasker, which he invited me to do this last one, which was really really cool. Um, so the paper that that we're basing this interview off of is in this uh, Polish journal for philosophy called. Uh, uh, Philosophiki Rosniki. I'm not pronouncing that correct. I'm sorry. Um, but, but they asked Hasker to do like a special issue and Hasker was like, Ryan, you want to, you want to come debate this? I'm like, yeah, okay. Why not? Like I'll debate with Hasker. That's fun. Um, and it took a, a long time to just lay out what the doctrine is. So it's, there's a lot of detail there and there's a lot of history there. And if you want to see the other side of someone push back against all the arguments I've just laid out, just see Hasker's response. Um, because he has some interesting things to say to try to try to rebut all the objections I've laid out. Well, that's awesome. And William Hasker is awesome. Like who would want to, like who would turn out a chance to debate William Hasker? Right. Like that, yeah. yeah. That's awesome. Um, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. I always appreciate talking with you because you're very well thought out. You're very articulate. Appreciate your preparation and whatnot for this. Um, how can people like follow you, connect with you, things like that, Ryan? Mm -hmm. So you can go to my website, which is rtmullins.com. Uh, there you'll find links to the different schools that I work at. So you could come study with me at the University of Lucerne with the online master's program in philosophy, theology, and religions. Um, and, or uh, if you're more interested like in traditional in-person sort of teaching, I teach one course uh, um, every other year at Palm Beach Atlantic University. So I'm a regular visiting professor there. Well, Ryan, thank you so much for coming on the podcast today. Really appreciate you and everything you're doing. I'll leave some links down below where people can follow you, connect with you, things like that. Uh, and for anyone listening here, uh, this is Inhuman Apologetics. Be sure to leave a like, subscribe, all that fun stuff. And you can support the show at patreon.com slash Inhuman Apologetics if you want to do so. But Ryan, one last time, thank you so much for coming on. And I can't wait to figure out what country you're at the next time we talk. So that would be great. <laughs> well, thank you everyone for listening. I hope you have a good one and God bless. We'll catch you next time.